So number four is what you say is so. When it, when it, listen to this one carefully. Whenever you have given your word to others as to the existence of something or some state of the word, world, your word includes being willing to be held accountable that the others would find your evidence makes what you have asserted valid for themselves. Read it again. I'll read it for you. What you say is so, whenever you have given your word to others as to the existence of some thing or some state of the world, your word includes being willing to be held accountable that the others would find your evidence makes what you have asserted valid for themselves. If I give you my evidence of why I say this is what the way the world is, I'm willing to be held accountable by you that that's the way you would see the world too. You would agree with me. Now, what that does... I would also agree. Yeah. Now, what that does is it prevents all lying, all exaggerations, all... I didn't actually lie to you, but I allowed you to have this expectation of, some, of something, and you were counting on me, and since I didn't say anything about it, you assumed it must be right. Okay, now, people play that game all the time. And what it does is destroy... It's incredibly damaging to the relationship, whatever the relationship is, a business relationship, a romantic relationship, a friendship. And this one is brilliantly written, just astoundingly perceptive. And when you violate that rule, you're causing yourself trouble. You're, you're certainly going to undermine the effectiveness of being a leader and any oh. exercise of leadership. All right. Standing for something. What you stand for, that is what you say that your life is about and, or for what you can unquestionably be counted on. Or you could be saying that about what the firm is about and what the firm can be unquestionably counted on. Whether expressed in the form of a declaration made to one or more people or even to yourself, as well as what you allow people to believe that you stand for is a part of your word. What I allow people to believe I stand for is part of my word. You know, I may know darn well you expect, you, you think I'm this kind of person and I allow you to do that. Well, that's my word. Now, people will allow others to see themselves in certain ways and they know darn well they're not that way and they're not going to behave that way. That causes trouble every time time it happens. The moral, ethical, and legal standards, the moral, ethical, and legal standards for which you have not explicitly declined are part of your word. Now, there's a, this is a short version of this. So, the moral, ethical, and legal standards of the company, the culture, the society, uh, the state, the town that you live in are part of your word unless you have explicitly announced that you're not going to follow those. And what we didn't have room to put on the slide is you willingly bear the consequences of that. So here's an example, Gandhi. You know, this little not very well dressed guy changed the lives of 600 million people by being clear with the British government about the rules he was not going to follow. And he was clear that he was willing to undertake and undergo the punishments that they might mete out. And the, the, the nonviolent movement, Martin Luther King, and another example going on here. Enormously powerful. And very different from lying and cheating in the, in the, in the, in the shadows. So integrity is honoring your word. We've just talked about what your word is. And honoring your word is keeping your word and on time. <clears throat> Sorry. Or... Whenever you will not be keeping your word, just as soon as you become aware that you will not be keeping your word, including not keeping your word on time, you say to everyone impacted that you will not be keeping your word and that you will keep that word in the future and by when, or that you won't be keeping that word at all, and what you will do to deal with the impact on others of your failure to keep your word or to keep it on time. So you clean up the mess as best as you can. Now, every one of us doesn't want to admit when we're not going to keep our word. 
and we certainly don't want to tell the people that are depending on us to keep that word that we're not going to keep it. And I guarantee you that causes enormous amounts of trouble in the world. And what I'm asking you to do, you don't have to announce it because there's not a single person in this room, including Werner and I, that doesn't do it. And this won't make any difference to you, none, unless you discover it in your own life. Oh, you know that thing Mike was saying? I remember about six months ago I did one of those. And then you may find out there were two yesterday. And <laughs> Just one quick word. That's my experience. Since this is about leadership, it's important to recognize that out of integrity behavior as a leader undermines the foundation on which you are standing to be a leader and exercise leadership. It's just that simple. And you know it when you've been in the company of a leader who's out of integrity. Really bad cases of it are outright lies or obfuscations or unwilling to tell the truth, withholding. People don't trust them. They're not going to follow them. <coughs> I think it's a very simple basis. It gives you a reason, an excuse not to be accountable. Right. I mean, if my boss, if my leader doesn't stand on a firm foundation, why should I worry about whether I did a good job or didn't do a good job? Yeah. Or my justifications are as good as his. Exactly. <laughs> so anybody, we're now over time. So anybody that has things to be doing, the cocktails, I've assured that no cocktails are going to be served downstairs until I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so, Michael, so, we got to go fast. Yeah. <laughs> I promise to shut up. As this new model of, it, it, unless it's something important, Werner. This new model of integrity points out, integrity is the state or condition in being whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition. Such a state is the necessary and sufficient condition for workability. Think about the bicycle. And workability is a necessary condition for performance. As a result, it becomes clear that integrity determines the opportunity set for performance. It doesn't tell you what you're going to get, but the closer you are to being in integrity, the bigger is your opportunity set. And the bigger is your opportunity set, the better you can do. Yet one only needs to read the newspaper to be clear about the almost universal lack of integrity. How can that be? The answer is, the fact that integrity determines one's opportunity for, perform per for performance is concealed by what, paraphrasing Rawls, the political scientist, we term the veil of invisibility. There are 11 factors that contribute to this veil of invisibility, and we will discuss some, but not all of these below. So let's consider what it's like to be a person of integrity, to be whole and complete as a person in your word. And I want you to be thinking about what it would be like if this was the description of your life. As we said, at least in the matter of integrity, who you are is your word, nothing more and nothing less. In a very real sense, who you are, period, is your word. You have very little dominion over your mental state, emotional state, physical state, or even what you think or remember, what comes to mind. But you do have something to say about what comes out of your mouth. Given that your word is that, is that over which you do have dominion, it is, as we said, not too much to say that who you are is your word. Perhaps the most important aspect of being out of integrity is the loss of self. Or if that is too much for you to take in, then think about it as the loss of power. In a very real sense, you are your word. When you are out of integrity as a person, you are as a person less than whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition. Instead of being a person of power because you have lost your power, you are left being a person of force and cunning. When you honor your word to yourself and others, you are at peace with yourself and therefore act from a place where you are at peace with others and the world, even those who disagree with who might ordinarily feel threatened by. You might ordinarily feel threatened. You know, I spent, I don't know, 55, 60 years biting my fingernails. It was socially embarrassing. I couldn't stop. But when I got this integrity stuff, that stopped. 
I got more whole and complete. Whatever it was that was gnawing away at me was that lack of integrity that manifested itself in that way and lots of other ways. And my colleagues can tell you more stories about me. <clears throat> you live without fear for yourself. That is, who you are as a person, there is no fear of losing the admiration of others. You do not have to be right. You act with humility. Everything or anything that someone might say is okay for consideration. There's no need to defend or explain yourself or rationalize yourself. You are able to learn. This state is often mistaken as mere self-confidence rather than the true courage that comes from being whole and complete. That is, comes from being a man or woman of integrity. This is a critically important element of being a leader. Now, given where we are, I'm going to... Does anybody know how to run this computer? Because I run a I'll Mac. Do, whatever you want. What do, you want? do you know? Uh, let's get to the end. Let's get to the end, Werner, where... Uh, Where do you want me to go? Uh, go? Let's go through all of this stuff. Go past all of it. Yeah. Great. By the way, I agree. Okay, now I'll get a little slower. A picture of integrity. That's what I wanted. So are there are 11 things that... It's called work I know I'm getting thirsty as well as the rest of you. Um, what would your life be like and what would your performance be if the following were true? You've done what you said you would do and you did it on time. Just dwell in this. You've done what you said you would do and you did it on time. You've done what you know to do. You did it the way it was meant to be done and you did it on time. You've done what others would expect you to do even if you never said you would do it and you did it on time or about this or that expectation of theirs, you have informed them that you will not meet this or that expectation. And you have informed others of your expectations of them and have made explicit requests to those others. No hidden expectations, explicit requests. And whenever you realize that you are not going to do any of the foregoing or not going to do it on time, you've said so to everyone who might be impacted and you did so as soon as you realized that you wouldn't be doing it or wouldn't be doing it on time. And if you are going to do it in the future, you have said by when you would do it. And you have dealt with the consequences of your not doing it on time or not doing it at all for all those who are impacted by your not doing it on time or not doing it at all. You've cleaned up the mess in their lives. You've done the best you can to do that. In a sentence, you have done what you said you would do, or you have said you are not doing it. You have nothing hidden. You are truthful, forthright, straight, and honest. And you have cleaned up any mess you have caused for those depending on your word. And almost unimaginable, what if others operated in this way with you? What if you operated in a company, or in a family, or in a university in which everybody interacted with everybody else that way? That would be an amazing place to be. And it just comes from knowing what your word is and honoring that word, not keeping it. Most of the crap that gets written about integrity where people have gone partway down this road says, when you give your word, you must keep it. That's totally fatal. So what happens if I gave my word to you about X, Y, or Z, and then I found out that Melissa had to die. Did you just say had to die? Yeah. <laughs> In order for me to keep I that word. I to make sure we, like, yeah. held me off. So I'm, so I'm not going to keep that word to you. No, you see, I, I, what I want you to get is you cannot be trapped simply because you gave your word that you're gonna have to fulfill it. You honor it. And you'll get yourself in all kinds of trouble if you think you got to keep your word. Because then you're gonna start hiding it, you're gonna work arounds, and it's all out of integrity. 
Well, you don't give your word to something big enough to make your life worthwhile. Yeah, okay, let's stop right there. Um, Mike, I want to do those last three slides, I promise. To oh, yes, yeah. okay, good. So, here... You want me to find it for you? The last three. Uh, it'll work better if you do it that way. The workaround. Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, so, go. let me just do this quickly. You know, we made this outrageous statement that there's a context which, if mastered, leaves you being a leader and exercising leadership effectively as your natural self-expression, and we're going to give you the opportunity to create that context for yourself in six days. Nobody should believe that. I wouldn't believe it if somebody told me. So now I'm going to take three slides to leave you with the sense of just how powerful certain contexts can be. Why? <coughs> If you get closer up here. Yes, that's the only way it'll work. Okay, sorry to stand this in your way, apologies. This is the unworkability that's created by the lack of integrity. Okay. <laughs> the power of we can't stand back. There. Okay, come on. How many, how many of you have been told that stress is harmful to your health, it makes you sick, it increases your risk of everything from the common cold to cardiovascular disease? Most of us believe that stress is our enemy. Certainly that's the way I was brought up and told and blah, 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 blah. Okay. I'm going to tell you about a study of the effects of stress that I learned about from a Stanford University health psychologist, Dr. Kelly McGonigal. Much of what follows on this and the next slide is simply quoting her. The study tracked 30,000 adults for eight years. The study started by asking people, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? Three possibilities, little stress, uh, moderate stress, a lot of stress. They also asked, do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And then they used public death records to find out who of the 30,000 people died. Those people who experienced a lot of stress in the previous year had a 43% increased risk of dying. Unsurprising, we know stress is bad. However, but that was true only for those whose context for stress was that it is harmful to your health. Only those. And, by contrast, those who experienced a lot of stress, but whose context for stress was that it's not harmful to your health, had no increased risk of dying. In fact, they had the lowest risk of dying, including those who experienced low stress. This gives you a bit of a sense of the power of a context. The researchers in the two studies on which McGonigal's report is based estimated that over the eight years that they were tracking deaths, 182,000 Americans died prematurely, not from stress, but from their context for stress. The context is decisive. By the way, her uh, comments were based on two studies. Oh, God, I the key. Sorry. They're there somewhere. No, I think they got left off, Mike. Oh. They did. Okay, that, I, I just want to say two things. First off, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. As you can probably tell, I love doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I never take the opportunity for granted, so thank you. And secondly, you cannot know what an enormous privilege it is for me to work with Mike. So I just want to share with you the incredible privilege it is for me to work with Mike. Not only is it a privilege to work with him, but the enormity of the things that I've learned from him still move me. So thank you all very much. You would be able I just have one closing comment. You wouldn't be able to tell that from the amount of shouting that goes on. <laughs> By both of us, I might add. <laughs> we've, got a, All right. we've got a few small thank yous. First to Richard. Um, I don't think you have a shirt with our new positioning statement. I hope oh, it's the yeah. right size. <laughs> and then uh, for both Mike and Werner, uh, this is uh, a That's copy awesome. of the book about oh. Constellation Brands that oh, uh, Richard authored. Oh, so you find out more about one of the world's top much. companies in our backyard. And thank you all for joining. Sorry we're out of integrity. Say one thing, which yeah. is. 
we're going to have to give you new ones in three months. <laughs> so we owe you those. That will be the same, but there's three new chapters. So. All right. Cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, look forward to it. Thank you. Yep. Did you know uh, about that? Okay. Reception downstairs in the rotunda. If you can join us, that'd be great. Constellation Brands products. Okay.